it's such an interesting question, Julie. I thought about it um, in preparation for this, and I realised that I think of it, I, I have associations with ambition. Um, I think of ambition as being a sort of a high level of motivation or aspiration, but related specifically to kind of externally oriented goals like accumulation of status or wealth or power. Um, so that was my initial sense of that's how I think of ambition. Um, and I, 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 I think that's interesting because I'm not sure that ambition, when I, when I kind of slowed down and thought, you know, what are the different ways I could use the word ambition? Like, would I think that I had, was ambitious for a social project, you know, a project with social good outcomes? Um, it's not the word I would use for that. Interesting. But for me, ambition is definitely associated with those extrinsic, external outcomes, as opposed to what I think of as being the intrinsic motivation, so kind of social good or collective well-being or environmental so I don't think of myself being ambitious for, for example, the workshop or having been ambitious for Action Station. Or So that's just a, an interesting, and I think that probably comes from a lot of the values research that I've you know, spent a lot of time digging into because that very much puts ambition in that extrinsic space and uses different words to describe aspirations or goals that you might hold for more intrinsic outcomes. So yeah, that's kind of the first level of, un of response to that. There's a lot of unpacking in there, mm -hmm. obviously. But that's, and so when I think about, am I ambitious? I think I, think I used to be and I'm not anymore. Okay. And now well, what I am is like driven and highly motivated and I have, you know, but I don't, wouldn't use the word ambitious anymore because I don't feel like those extrinsic things matter to me anymore. So what changed for you? Well, I think when I was younger, there was a, there was a time when, getting sort of external recognition or status for my work helped me feel more confident in my work. So, you know, getting, for example, getting, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Being given a more senior position within the organisation would give me two things. One, I think, a sense of, like, being recognised and that would kind of external recognition of my capability gave me a greater sense of my capability and secondly it gave me a kind of a hierarchical or positional power within an organization which I think at that time was quite important because I didn't necessarily know how to use other forms of influence and power um, so yeah so I think when I was younger I aspired more to those kind of external recognitions of my capacity or capability and I aspired a bit more to like that kind of positional power within systems I thought that was how I was going to have influence by sort of making my way into more you know positions of more power now I think I understand influence in a really different way and don't feel that needs to be that you know that I need to be in a p p place of positional power in order to be influential yeah I'm really interested in your distinction between sort of intrinsic motivation and ambition in, in the value space, because what you were describing as, as, as sort of things that drive you or, or motivate you intrinsically, um, a lot of our other interviewees, have, that's, that's how they've described ambition for themselves. So I'm, I'm interested in what, um, what kind of intrinsic motivations you have as well. Yeah. 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 Um, so I think, I mean, I'm highly intrinsically motivated, like extremely <laughs> I'm a, an extremely motivated person um, and I'm motivated by having positive impact in the world, like extremely motivated by that. It's really uh, like so important to me that I put off having a child until I was in my late forties because I knew it would disrupt my ability to, to do some of the work that I saw as having probably a wider collective good. Yeah. Um, so the kind of things that motivate me are kind of, you know, creating more equal world, reducing harm, violence, inequality, um, like just everywhere you look and see problems, I'm extremely motivated to try and find solutions to them. Like that's just 
you know, for the bulk of my life, I worked seven days a week, um, had very little life outside of my work because my work was driven by that motivation mm. to create solutions to complex problems. Um, I'm also really motivated. I'm not, like I think that was the other part of my life, which is the part of my life in which I do endurance running. Okay. I was thinking about that in relation to this because like what motivates you to run for, you know, a hundred kilometers is that ambition. I don't think of it as ambition at all because I'm not at all. There's no part in me which is thinking about what place I might get in the race or do you know what I mean? Like there's nothing that relates to an external recognition because I'm definitely not going to (laughs) place in the race. So what motivates you to do something like that? Like what is that? And maybe some people would think of that as ambition. I don't know. But for me, it's like what motivates me to do that is like this fascination by limits. I'm really fascinated by like, what are my physical limits? Can I get to the end of them and then go further? Where do you think this this really strong intrinsic motivation came from? Were you were you did you come that way, or is it from how you grew up? Do you do you, do you identify where that where that started? Um, I think it's a bit of both. Um, if I look at, I don't know how to pull apart the kind of nature nurture thing. So mm-hmm. my best kind of better to look at my sisters who have probably similar nature and nurture so I can't tell you which mm-hmm. of it is nature and which is nurture but I can tell you that my sisters are both really driven in that way too and particularly when it comes to sort of athletic and physical things like my sisters are both people who love to push themselves really hard physically so there's some thing in there I don't know if we were born with it like if it was a genetic inheritance (laughs) or whether it was just the way that we were raised but there's clearly something in that early part of my life that introduced me to the pleasure of pushing yourself hard because I think that's that you can either experience that as really pleasurable or really unpleasurable right and for Mm -hmm. some people it's really unpleasurable like they get to that feeling of physical discomfort and they're like Ugh, that's awful why would you do that and others of us have somehow whether it's through the way that we're wired or the way that we experienced it as children we get to that point where we're like oh this is exciting like this feels hard and feel something that feels hard is fun and, and it's exciting. exhilarating fun and yeah 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 so i don't i don't have any theory about whether that's a genetic or an early childhood but i we all have it. So my guess is it's coming from somewhere in those early years, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then I think that translates across into other parts of our life. So we have really different paths, but, you know, so my younger sister owned a retail store and she bought it and then just like transformed it into like a way better, like just like transformatively better business um and my older sister is in farming and it's you know kind of just a really i think fantastic successful um businesswoman um and it's just always motivated to do things really really well so yeah so there's clearly something in the way that we were born and raised that instilled in us a kind of a an enjoyment of hard work. Like I really think we enjoy working hard and we value it really, really highly. And that's probably a farming thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I grew up on a farm as well. I absolutely recognise that what you're describing. You know, yeah, it's yeah. like getting out together as a family and making hay is a is turned into like a both a it's an obligation, there's no question of you not doing it. But also it's like, it's something you take pleasure in, right? You take pleasure in the job done well. Um, and the, and, and seeing take, where you've been, seeing where you've been at the end of it also. Yeah. So there's a lot of like early experience of pleasure and satisfaction and hard work and in the outcomes of that hard work. Mm. So that 
I think there's a lot in there that overlaps with ambition, but I don't think of it as ambition because ambition to me feels like you're always trying to top something. Whereas with something like well, with farming, the satisfaction is in getting that job done well, not having been the best at doing it or, you know, having the best haystack. It's like the, the satisfaction comes in getting all the hay in before the rain comes or I don't know. It's a really interesting trickiness around the word, word ambition for me. Mm. So if, if I were to ask you to describe an ambitious person that you know, or even the most ambitious person that you know, what kind of characteristics would come into mind? I would probably think of someone like Judith Collins. Mm -hmm. I would think of ruthlessness. I would think that somebody who is really driven by that extrinsic external measures of success is more likely to be willing you know to make the means justify the end no the end justify the means mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. so if you're really focused on that end that extrinsic end that ambition kind of carries that sense for me like ambition is focused on the end point then i think some of the risks that come with that are ruthlessness um unethical behavior, um, I guess doing things that are oriented towards the end rather than really valuing the process of the work to get there and having your values really embedded in doing the work and doing it properly and doing it ethically and doing it collaboratively and doing, you know, like all the things that I've been kind of raised to value. I'm looking at my next question. What would enable you to be more ambitious and thinking, given how you've described your relationship with the word and your feelings about the word, I'd, I'd rather ask, is there anything that would enable you to have more balance? Do you feel now that, now that you're a parent that your balance has shifted in terms of where you're directing your energy? I'll take a step back from that because I don't think it's to do with having become a parent I think I was able to become a parent because the balance had shifted interesting and I um I think it's really interesting I do think it's really interesting I don't think I could have made space for or even chosen to pursue becoming a parent had I not already shifted that balance because previously I could not allow myself to do something that was just for me. And having a child was clearly just for me. It didn't serve the world in any productive way, right? Like the world didn't need more children. That was not a thing that <laughs> the world was in need of. It was in need of many things <laughs> that I could contribute to, but having a baby wasn't one of them. So I had to get to a point where I shifted in this really deep way to see that my needs and desires, things that were purely about what, I desired had their own value and were worthy of pursuit, even if I couldn't see how they were the top priority for collective well-being. And that, that was must... a huge shift for me. Huge shift. Because, I mean, you, if you're raised in the Brethren Rural Church, your personal desires are never more important than the collective good. So like that was, it's really interesting. People often make these kind of like generalizations about Pākehā values. And I'm like, I didn't grow up in those values. I don't know <laughs> what I grew up in because they're clearly not Māori or Pacifica values, but they're really not that kind of stereotype of like Western Pākehā values, you know, of individualism. And it's not how I grew up. I grew up with a really deep, deep teaching about like putting the collective before yourself and I don't think many people made of it what I made of it <laughs> right I don't think many people took it to the point that I took it to but that's what we were taught and then I guess I then assessed the world and my assessment of the world was these are the collective needs and people having more children clearly doesn't fit into them so I can't justify doing that and it really took a very deep kind of personal 
therapeutic process really to get to the point where I'm like you're allowed to want something just because you want it and you're allowed to do it just because you want it and it feels uncomfortable even still saying that Mm. Mm. so that was what needed to shift for me to have balance in my life was a shift from thinking that you must always subsume personal desire to collective good to thinking you can balance those two things Mm. 